This is Basket Case Clubs, CPR Group's podcast where we turn basket case clubs into showcase clubs. Hello everyone and welcome back to Basket Case Clubs. My name is Michael Connolly and I am delighted to be taking you on this journey of basket casey goodness with my brother and very good buddy, Steve Connolly. G'day Steve, how you doing? I'm bloody great. I'm also excited to go on this journey and we're coming towards the end of our planning series of podcast episodes. I think we started uh, calling it a mini series, but we were talking about it the other night and you said, uh, no, when you're getting to nine episodes, that's not a mini series. <laughs> Let's call it a mega series. <laughs> <laughs> so it's the strategic planning for community sporting organizations. Mega series. series, 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 series. <laughs> Did you know, Steve, that Basket Case Clubs, as Steve's actually taking a sip of coffee out of his Basket Case Clubs mug. Is... I feel very late night drinking out of these. <laughs> you know, the late show, rather. It, it drinking out perfectly of perfectly still. Only I know that. <laughs> and it may be anything in here. It could be water. It could be... Depending on the time of day. Y- yes, it is coffee, indeed. Uh, and... Look, if you're interested, uh, get in touch and you can request some Basket Case Clubs merch because we've got a bit and it's cool stuff. It is the world's best. You know what? I've figured out, Steve, that Basket Case Clubs is the universe's favourite community sporting podcast. Did you know that? As it's voted a, it's by official. my mum. Michael and Steve. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, you boys, it's wonderful stuff. Uh, a podcast only a mother could love. A bit like your face. <laughs> <laughs> On a platter, that one. <laughs> yes, you set them up and I'll knock them down. Oh, but anyway, we should probably start talking about club planning anyway. So today we would like to talk about the importance of consultation. And uh, there's a couple of things that I want to... Um, I want to get off my chest. Uh, consultation is sometimes seen as an end in itself. We've got to do consultation, so let's just do it and it's done. Now, I've certainly seen a, that happen a lot in a, in, a, in community engagement projects through councils, and so they'll they'll run a town hall meeting and like this is how how shitty consultation can get on a, a on a community engagement perspective. A, a, you know, there's a some project going on and they'll run a town hall meeting and I've literally been in some discussions after those town hall meetings where the the commentary that has come from the community is just completely poo-pooed. And yeah, okay, there are some annoying people who who have a like to like to be heard. Like to be heard and and have a um a demeanor that is less than one that that makes them it make, makes them look like nice people. Yeah, my tippy toeing around that enough for you, Steve. Some assholes in their <laughs> behaviour. But the thing is that they're not necessarily assholes in what they're saying. And the funniest thing is that you listen to these uh, very often, some not very often, but at least sometimes senior officers in local government, and we've certainly seen it in industry as well, and they just completely ignore the words that are coming out of a mouth because they don't like the mouth that they're coming out of in the first place. Yep. <sighs> and as humans, I think we're all a little guilty of oh, certainly we're guilty of being prone to that and some of us fall into that trap and and we see that on committees you know two people who end up on the same committee that don't like each other and just <laughs> shit this happens in parliament it happens in councils doesn't it where yep. you'll see people disagree with one another or vote the other way just because the alternative view is being presented by someone they don't like yeah exactly yeah so and i don't think we said that in a oh, i know that i've written a piece about it that says um uh, don't shoot the messenger has an ugly cousin. It's mm. yeah, not liking the words because of the mouth. So you've got to, some people have good things to say, but they just say them in a bad way. And you, you do, if you're going to do that sort of meaningful stakeholder engagement, you have to make it meaningful and you have to listen. But where I want to start is to be clear on why you want to do engagement anyway. So we're talking specifically about engagement that goes on in a, at club or association level where you're seeking input to your strategic direction. So we're, we're talking about strategic planning, which is planning that is, uh, is is at that nice high level. What does the future look like? Last time we talked about goal setting and we said, maybe you should only have five, like 
the what was it Anzac cookies we were talking yep, about? Yeah, yeah, it was. You know how hungry for Anzac cookies I've been since recording that episode of Indian You know you can go cookies. to Coles or Woolies and buy them. No, pre-made. no, our <laughs> mum makes the best Anzac cookies. They are, <laughs> they are the best. And I'm, I'm a crunchy Anzac cookie guy. Are you crunchy or squishy? Oh, that's a good question. I like both. I don't, I don't know if I've got a preference. I, I like to mix it up a bit. Uh, I, if I'm really hungry, it doesn't matter. Just get in my belly. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I'm a crunchy guy. I, I still like crunchy muesli bars that you really can't get anymore, which is probably why I like the the trail mixy bars that are made of nuts more than me. Anyway, back to the story. <sighs> You've got to be really clear on why you want to engage. So the community engagement or your community engagement can cover you. It can cover your volunteers. It can cover your members. If you're a junior sport, it can cover your parents. It can cover your officials and your coaches. If you've got staff, it can certainly cover your staff. But I think the most important thing is to understand why you're consulting. If you have a committee that is setting a strategic direction and you've got a mandate to do that, and you would only do consultation to get a tick in the box to say, yes, we consulted with our constituents, is there really value Don't in waste your doing time. it? Yeah. yeah. So do, do so. We say that that's more at the inform end of the spectrum. So there's this thing called IAP two, which is the International Association for Public Participation. And while look, a lot of it is very good. There is some some filler in there that that is great in theory, but when you put it into practice, it doesn't work. So some of the um, even some of the engagement methodologies that they suggest are a bit lame. Well, I was going to say twee. They're just a bit tired, and uh, you know, you know, they still talk about oh, there's you can use this. Well, I don't actually know because it's been a long time since I've read it. But there's this new technology called a QR code, and you can actually use that to go to a server. Oh, wow! Well, just because it's fun to play with my phone, I think we got sick of playing with QR codes through COVID. But it's about understanding where you. So they've got this spectrum, and it's really important to understand where you are on the spectrum. And the spectrum starts at the low end from inform. And so that means that we're not really engaging with you for you to help us design the outcomes here. We're engaging with you to let you know what outcomes we've decided that we're going to put into practice. So if that's where you are, then you don't need to do a detailed engagement program. You just need to do a good information program. And that's perfectly okay if that's where you are on the spectrum. But it goes all the way down to the other end which is where you're really empowering your community to help you co-design the solutions. But if you're at that end, then you've actually got to take a step back because you're not the designer anymore. You're only a participant. So you only have, when you're right down that end, you're really in the thick of it. So everyone is working on this together. And I think in club land, it's, it it depends because it, it can be down that end in a small club in particular where you've only got a small number of people and it's it's actually manageable to engage with most people on a, in a meaningful capacity. Fine, that's great. But it's possibly, it's off, often in larger organizations, it's more back to it. It's, n- it's never just inform, it's more consult. So there is, you will have input and some of these things may change. And I've certainly seen that happen really successfully where the board come or the committee comes up with some really great ideas that they think are are perfect, but then they run them up the flagpole and some people say, mm, look, I like that, but I think you are maybe pushing too hard in this direction and we've actually got more of an opportunity over there. And then they can and then they can make the the those tweaks or changes to make the whole plan stronger. And that's possibly where we're talking about predominantly. I was just going to ask before you said what you just said, where do you think on that spectrum, that public participation spectrum, most clubs get the greatest value out of their consultation during a planning process? And you kind of answered it with the good old consultant two words. It depends. (laughs) (laughs) A lawyer said the same thing, don't they? Yeah. (laughs) They learnt from us. So, And and I think that that's a fair enough response because it really does, it depends on so many factors. It depends on the nature of the organization, the size of the organization. It depends on the size of the group that are leading the strategic planning process or master planning or operational plan, whatever the planning process depends on the size and nature of the group that's leading that. For instance, I think one of the examples you just gave was, was, great in that if the, if it's the committee 
that have been elected by the members to make strategic decisions and to guide the direction of the organization, then in most instances, we can assume that there's a an agreement amongst the members that we entrust the these decisions to those people. And that might include preparing a strategic planning document. But in our experience, we've seen plenty of examples of the other thing that you pointed to, which is for a committee or a, a working party to come up with some ideas, goals, objectives, whatever, and not just present them as a fait accompli to the broader membership, which can be met with resistance too. And if people don't have at least an opportunity to buy in to the planning process, the likelihood that they're going to have ownership over the outcomes or outputs can be pretty limited. And I know we've spoken about this earlier in this not so mini series. So I think it's important to consider um, the, the circumstances of your organization when you're conducting a planning process, but not to just assume that you know everything because how often do we work with an organization through a planning process and the committee thinks they've got it nailed and they think, yes, this is all of the ideas for the future success of this club. And then they, for instance, run an online planning workshop and they seek, uh, sorry, they run an online planning questionnaire and they seek input from all members and some really unexpected ideas come in and some really golden nuggets of um, information are gathered through that process that lead to a far more deeply informed plan because of that consultation process, which was carried out during the preparation of the plan. So does that mean that you're considering when you engage at, at the different sorts of levels? Yeah. Well, that's an important question too. Do we go to them? Do we go to the broader membership, for instance, with a blank canvas? And do we ask them what they like about the club and what they don't like so much and what they would like to see more of? Or do we put something in front of them? And I think that depends on the nature of the planning that we're doing. If we're doing, for instance, um, facility planning, it might be more efficient to put something in front of people. And it might be more efficient to say, here's some ideas. Do you like them? Or mm. have you got some ideas of your own to improve these initial thoughts? So again... <laughs> It depends. It depends. It, it, yeah, the size. So I think we come back to the size as well. So if you've got a small organization mm -hmm. where, and it, and also the level of engagement. So if you've got a small but very engaged organization, we certainly see this in some craft groups where there's not a heap of members, but all of those members are really engaged in every aspect of the, of the craft group because if we're doing quilting, for instance, and we've all got to get there and pull the tables out and pull the machines out and gaff the the power cables to the ground and then we start doing our quilting and then when we're done we've got to do everything in reverse plus sweep all the threads away and and we're not done until we're done and so it, they, they all pull together so there's a very high level of engagement i'm imagining that an organization like that would have a fairly simple sort of plan and it, it doesn't need to be what well, certainly doesn't need to be particularly long but they would possibly have a high level of engagement with most people throughout the whole process but if you've got 2,000, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 members, mm -hmm. then sometimes, uh, interestingly, there's some less engagement. I turn up, I play, I go home. That, that's fine. So then it's up to us to make sure that we're connecting with the right people. We talked about this in marketing. Remember when we talked about how many how many people can you have? What is what is our purpose? Why do we exist? To be really clear on that, and we've certainly been through this in this series about planning, mm. to be really clear on that so that you're articulating the right sorts of messages to the right sorts of, to the right people. And if you're confident that you've got that pretty close, pretty right as a committee, and and fi you're maybe finding that out through your engagement, but that engagement is literally sitting on the sidelines talking to parents and talking to players and talking to coaches and talking to officials you're then able to distill that and say, well, this is the direction that we as the elected leaders want to take this organisation over the next three years and and then get on board. And and for those, you know, we've seen this happen. We talked about it last time, but we've seen you finally put your chips down and people say, oh, that's where the bus is going. Well, I didn't think that's where we're going. So it's, it's time to go. And sometimes the engagement process is your chance to, to test the water with, with, that that high level what are we what what is our purpose why do we exist mm. but then right down to the goals and then even what we're going to do and who can be involved in those and again yes it, de it depends on the size of the organization and the general level of engagement 
the one of the other things that you can consider is which part of the plan you're talking about. Because if you're talking, like I just said, so if you're talking about the purpose, then it might be some pretty high level and en- high level engagement. But if you're talking about specifically who's going to be doing what, and we'll talk about that when we get to actually operationalizing a plan then it might, you're getting into the granular level of detail and it might just be people who know their stuff. So when we're talking about maintenance, for instance, I'm a committee member. I don't know about, I don't know about how much tetrahydrochlorosulfide we need to be putting on the fields and at what frequency. So let's go and engage with the people who do. <laughs> <laughs> if anyone knows what tetrahydrosulfofluoride, whatever I said is, it's, I don't know, know. probably it's Brent. It's probably like just kill your grass like that if you actually do, <laughs> were to mix it up. I don't remember my organic. Don't take agronomy advice from basket case clubs. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know what agronomy means. Are those things you put in your ears when you can't hear properly. <laughs> um, hey, just also when you were talking a moment ago about size of the organization, the nature of consultation approaches. We've worked with national sporting organizations, for instance. You know, you, you mentioned an organization that might have one or two thousand members. If you're a national sporting organization and you have tens of thousands of members, of course the efficiency of consulting everybody is going to be somewhat questionable. So we've seen, and again this I mean it doesn't borrow from the IAP2 guidebook because you know focus groups and the like certainly predate a lot of that content but that idea of selecting groups of members within your organization and engaging them to you know provide a a sample of insights from throughout the membership can be effective as well and again, you know, if you're a really large organization, that might be necessary. And it can be a really good way, again, to demonstrate your inclusivity. And sometimes we even see in planning documents images from planning activities that have been conducted during the preparation of that document. So just as a as a reminder that, hey, this is not a plan that we've just pulled together without consultation. We have asked you you have provided feedback and here presented back to you is a document that includes some of your ideas and, you know, some ideas from others as well, whether they be decision makers or not. That's a really important, you've made a couple of really important points there. And the I often is, do that. You're welcome. You all, you always do, Steve. All of your points are good. <laughs> but, um, it's really important that it, we don't come across as poo-pooing engagement in a big organization because if if you go and like at, at a state or national level you go and draw a plan and it's got no connection to your stakeholders how do you think that's going to fly yeah and you're probably going to be a board that doesn't last very long so you need to listen you need to engage but it's about doing it in the most appropriate way for the for the the and that's why the, the focus group idea is a really good one in that case, because let's find some people who give us a representative sample of our members and let's engage with them in a meaningful way. And that's those focus group sessions shouldn't just be a quick 15 minute online call. It should be actually, let's, let's get into this. And you want to also find the assholes. So I'm probably using the term a bit loosely there, but this is what we call the red hatters. You want people who are who don't think like you. You want to falsify your ideas. You don't want to just go and find a whole heap of people who, who agree with it. I don't know if you remember, Steve, when I did this thing. So I'm going to write down a rule on the back of this piece of paper. And then I'm going to write some numbers on the front. So I'm writing two, four, and six. And I have a rule on the back of the piece of paper. Now you can guess... Any, num- any number of numbers that you want to see what's the next number in the sequence. You can guess any number of numbers that you want, but you only get to guess the rule once. So what are you going to do? I got two, does, four, does, and six. Yeah, so does eight come next? Is no, that what I'm doing? Am I asking it, it, you questions or am I guessing? And it, you're going to say yes I'm, or no? No, I'm not going to say. I'm going to say fits the rule. So what do you want to do next? It, would seven work? Fits the rule. Okay. Keep so going. now do I get to, uh, does 10 work? Fits the rule. Does one work? Does not fit the rule. Okay. What's the, so, so what do you want to do? You, so you can get, you only get to guess the rule once, but you can guess. Uh, as many uh, as you want. <laughs> I don't know. 
I, I want to guess the rule, but I don't want to get it wrong because I hate losing. Because well, do more do so. This is where people go wrong, Steve. They they think that they get it, and but you've done the right thing. You tested it when you said one. So mm -hmm. why don't you test it some more? Does five work? Does not fit the rule. Does one million eight hundred and seventy two thousand two hundred and ninety six fit the rule? Fits the rule. <laughs> Does three work? Does not fit the rule. Is the rule that the numbers are increasing? Yeah. So I wrote down that the the next number is greater than the last. Okay. But people say two, four, six, eight. And they go, yeah, the rule is that you've got to increase by two. And they they, they only test it once. No, it doesn't okay. that's not right. So they, and then you're out and they go, whoa, whoa. So that's so I've what, won. What you're saying is I win. You are Thank the winner, you. Steve. Yes, In this one person winner. game. <laughs> yeah. And I'm pretty hey, that's sure a great. I, I'm just going to play one person games from now on. Yeah. No, wait, I suck at golf. <laughs> and there's also solitaire. <laughs> yeah, I suck at that no, too. Seriously, if I'm ever if I ever go hiking, you know, bear grill style, I'm going to throw a pack of cards into my pack because if I'm lost out in the middle of nowhere, I'm going to lay out a game of solitaire, and within ten minutes, somebody's going to lean over my shoulder and say, "You can put the queen on the king, mate." <laughs> <laughs> oh. So you, the idea is to try and get it wrong. So that's why you want red hatters yep. in your group. You want the people who disagree with you. You might want some, uh, I, I think it was Abe Lincoln who, as soon as he was elected, then appointed his opponents. Now, I, I haven't read his biography myself, so I don't know whether they were the same party or the other party, but he put them into his cabinet. And like his aides are going, what the hell are you doing, mate? These are assholes. They were the ones who called you the most nasty things in the world. And now you're going to work. He said, I don't want just a room full of people who are going to say yes to me. I want mm. people who are going to challenge. I I don't. I'm not the smartest person here. I'm just the one who happened to get elected. So now I need to surround myself with people who are smarter than me and who have different opinions to me. And that's the purpose of consultation. And and by red hatting it at every level, find those people who you who you when they were in power, you didn't like what they were doing. Get them involved because not only is that a great re relationship building tool, you're also going to find points of view that you don't have on your own. And that's so powerful. So how to do it then? So I've got a few notes here, Steve. It depends. It depends. So let me tell you two words. Butcher's paper. What does it conjure up? A vision of people leaning over a table with Sharpies in hand, scribbling, drawing pictures, writing words. And the sweet smell of text drink in the air, yes. <laughs> mm -mm. <laughs> and how good, how good <laughs> do you reckon that is? How effective do you reckon butcher's paper exercises are as far as consultation goes? It depends. Yeah, I knew you were going to say that. It so can be really effective. It, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it can be really effective. It depends can also on what happens ne next day. Eh? Depends on what happens next, yeah. yeah. It can also really suck. Often, as you're alluding to there, because everything just stops at the end of that planning session. Or we do a list of strengths and weaknesses. And we're also humble, as we said, we do have this tiny list of strengths and you do a massive list of weaknesses, but then you don't actually do anything with those weak with the weaknesses that you've written down. So if you're doing this by way of a workshop and you're engaging lots of people, you've then got to critically say, well, hang on a minute, do we need to actually fix these weaknesses? Or are we better off saying, you know what, we suck at that. That Does it have to be our job? And can we cut that off and let some other community organisation deal with that bit? And we'll go and do what we are really good at and then build on our strengths. So you're using your emotional energy to build on things that you're already good at rather than fix things that are, don't really need to be done anyway and other people can do them. The other thing that I wanted to add to Butcher's paper though, Steve, and this is one that's often missed, and I think I've got some, I'll go and get them when you're talking, um, is don't just write words, literally draw pictures. It is so powerful to draw pictures. And then you get a room full of people who say, oh, I can't draw. And I said, when you were at kindy, if I'd asked you if you could draw, what would you have said? Oh, I probably would have said yes. Then you can draw. Everyone can draw. Stick people are perfectly okay. And it's so, it, it, and then there's a story that goes along with the picture. And when you get people to explain the story, and when I do this, Steve, I actually record the session because it's far better to be engaged. And I just take notes on questions that I want for clarification, then then I capture how people talk about it. And then you, you when you listen back to it, it, the passion that people have put into it, it's just incredibly powerful. 
So to get people to draw and then to talk through it means that they, they're they're connecting emotionally and they're connecting with those part the creative parts of your brain, which is actually what we're looking for. So you you're saying let's get creative when we're doing this con- this consultation. So actually get creative. Love it absolutely. And in our experience, it is such a win to get creative because people actually firstly document their thoughts because as you know yep. you got butcher's paper out and you say write some ideas get a group of people together let's say you got a room full of 30 people and you break them up into four of, groups of four or five and you say you as a group are going to discuss this and you as a group are going to discuss that and we wander around and there's great discussion happening and there's no notes being taken yep but if we say you as a group are going to discuss this and you're going to draw it in a picture here's a, a box of um, what are they called connector pens, lots of different colors, share them around, draw the pictures, and then you get the group to collectively come and present them to the larger group. Holy crap, man, you actually get ideas yeah. documented. And yes, yep. filming it so that you can reflect on that recording subsequently and, and be properly involved as yeah. the facilitator um, yep. is, is great. But yeah, so we bad. find that people actually document the ideas if you get them to draw them. Yep. And sticky notes as well. Stick a, so if you want to write words, either just write words on your drawing or write sticky notes so you can shift them around as well. But right. if you're going to use stick, sticky notes, what's your golden rule, Michael? <laughs> Why don't you go and share that? There we go. I'll show you. Oh, look, the back's ripped off. The 3M only, baby. Got to use 3M sticky notes because they're the only ones that stay stuck, but they also take. Otherwise, they're non sticky notes. <laughs> and the sticky note on the floor is worth nothing. But And then I'd take a glue stick and I'd stick them all down once they're in their spot because then they can't move. Then they're, they're probably stuck. Real freaking sticky. Yeah. Yep. And the other one is surveys. So you mentioned it before, but you've got to be really careful with surveys because, like, I am so sick of surveys when I travel. I will get off the plane and then go to the hire car and I get get the hire car and then I go and get my bags. By the time I'm pulling my phone out to connect to the hire car, there's a survey that says, how was your car hire pickup experience? And then I drop the car back and it was, how was your drop off experience? And then how was the the experience in general? Like three surveys or four surveys from the freaking hire car place. And it's just delete, delete, delete. It, that, because by the time you unsubscribe for the first one, it takes a day or two. So you get a go these. God, don't care. So you don't want it to be like that. Having said that, though, if you do do a survey, you're not go. Very rarely do we get statistical significance. So, what if you've got say 300 members? You'd need 100 and my math isn't my statistics and my math isn't going to be good enough here. But you're going to need 160, so some somewhere in there. So you're going to need a lot to make it statistically significant, and you, you're very unlikely to get that. We have got that level of level of response. Which is great. It means that at, at the time there were quite a few red hatters, which meant that these guys re- this is a democracy. So if you've got a lot of people who are calling you assholes, you've really got to have a good look in the mirror and say, "Well, what are we doing here?" And you've got to listen. You've got you can't just think, mm. "Oh, why is everybody else so stupid and I'm I'm the only one who's smart?" You got to look around, like you said last time. If you look around and you don't know who the dickhead is, probably you. So even though you're not going to get to statistical significance, you're likely to get the people who want to have a say. So let them have a say. Listen to them, and then you so you're still likely to get good information. Yep. That just quickly the do you call them the red hatters? Yep. <laughs> I really struggled to get the term mad hatters out of my head. Then <laughs> uh, we make a similar suggestion when an organisational is going through some transformative process, like writing a new constitution get those people who you anticipate might ask the hard questions down the track involved as early as possible Mm. because you want them to challenge the process and the thinking of others involved. And you can also save yourself a lot of heartache down the track by involving them early enough so that they have had input and they then become ideally the champions of the new document. And often these people who are the vocal minority in an organization are looked to by others because they're scared of them. And if, if they're supportive of the document as it's presented, whether it's a constitution or whether it's a planning document, then that can help with that social proof in getting buy-in from everyone else. Yep. Yep. So the final thing that I want to touch on is then when to engage. And we've kind of weaved around this a little bit through the, as we've been having the discussion, but again, when you engage depends on where you are on the spectrum and what level of input that you want. So as a general rule, 
I would suggest not trying to do it all in one go. So if you want to do a little bit at the front, and that can be right at the very beginning, we've had our first brainstorming, and we think that this is kind of how we're going to settle on the purpose for our organization. Let's go and run that up the flagpole, literally just by... If you've got a bar, go and sit at the bar and have a chat to a few people. If you've got a home game day, wander around and have a chat to a few people. And whether they're your members or the visiting team, it doesn't matter. Just go and have a chat to a few people and see how it goes. See what happens and and tweak it, change it during that day. And then if you're looking for surveys, what sort of questions are you going to be asked? Is it just just um pure greenfield stuff like you mentioned before where it's just what do you like what do you think we could be doing better or is it more specific so how would you rate our uh, i'm not a big fan of the net promoter score you know the on a scale of one to ten how likely are you to recommend us to friends or family because anything lower than i think a a seven or lower is negative so why don't you just make it one two and three (laughs) like good and everything else like it's i don't like it but there's merit in that sort of question when we're talking here and not i'd yeah, not suggesting you do the net promoter score, but you can say, how are we performing in these areas? Yeah, you're doing okay, you could do better, you're doing great, or you're doing terribly, and that might be enough. And how important is that? And always have a few open text fields for people to be able to say what they want. And sometimes, as you said, that's where the little gold nuggets exist in there. Yep. So long and short of it, Steve, consultation is not an end in itself. It's not something you do to get a tick in a box. It's something that you do to make your planning better so that you're making sure that you're connecting with the right people at the right times and in the right way. And by that, I mean in the right way for them. Yep. Bringing different perspectives, broader ideas than a a group that's too small might not necessarily be able to raise and challenging each other in ways that a small group can't do successfully either. Fits the rule. (laughs) <laughs> Steve, as usual, it has been a pleasure having a chat to you about, well, in our mega series on strategic planning. I'm really looking forward to some of the great interviews we've got coming up in some episodes over the next few weeks as well. So stay tuned for those. And if you've got any, we've had some really good suggestions. And in fact, the next episode we're going to do was a suggestion from a listener said, oh, well, you're talking about this strategic planning stuff. How about we talk about how to operationalize it? So that's where we're going to go next. If you're not already connected to us on social media, make sure you do follow us on, where are we? Facebook, Insta, LinkedIn. Make sure also you've signed up to our newsletter where we're going to give you some tasty tidbits on a pretty regular basis, but not too frequent that we give you newsletter overload. And of course, we've got a phone number, 1-800-100-204. Something like that. Put a little question mark at the end of that, Steve, (laughs) because I think that's right. Hang on, let me get over here. Yeah, I got it right. Man, that's so lucky. 1-800-104. And you can you can talk to us. We actually liked <laughs> I was going to say we actually like talking. One day we'll do an episode where we don't just talk smack. <laughs> <laughs> hey, one day we'll do an episode where we don't talk. It'll be like one of those instrumental uh, episodes of Bluey or something, you know, where it's all just music. That'll be great. People will probably enjoy that a little more. Oh, just white noise. <laughs> We might have people falling asleep. We might have people falling asleep as it is. You never know. <laughs> oh, and on that note, thanks very much, Steve. Pleasure as always. See ya. Bye. Basket Case Clubs acknowledges the traditional custodians of the country on which we record, being Yugambir, Tarabal, Jagera, and Kabi Kabi land. We recognise their enduring connection to land, waters, and culture, and pay our respects to Elders past, present, and emerging and extend that respect to First Nations listeners. 